know, listen to me for just a moment. I, I watch television and I see all kinds of things that happen in, in the world and boy, they get pretty excited. They get enraged sometimes. I've seen some of them throw the biggest mess of parties you've ever seen in your life. And most of the time, it's, it's over nothing more than just something they've had to drink or, or something they've taken. They've tried to escape from reality. And they find their joy all in the world's ways of hiding. Wearing a mask. You don't know who I really am. I love the fact this morning that we came in here and we have said, Lord, we are here and we want nothing more than you. And he shows up right here in the midst of his people. He shows up right here in our midst. If you can't feel him, if you cannot feel him right now, I'd be on my face somewhere hiding out trying to get a hold of the Spirit of God. If I didn't feel Him right now, I'd be worried about what happened to me when the rapture takes place. If I didn't feel the presence of the Lord right now in this house, I'd be concerned about my soul for all of eternity. How many of you know what I'm talking about this morning? Now somebody says, Somebody says, preacher, you just proved, you just proved what I've always thought. You people are crazy. Thank you very much. I'm quite educated. I have a college degree. Christian education, business administration, Bible. I've worked hard in my life. I'm good to people, I'm kind, I'm reasonably intelligent. The true deception, my sister, the true deception, my brother, is to have lived your entire life believing a lie about your eternity. Believing a lie about God. We will excuse the crowds in a football stadium. We will excuse the drunks on a Friday night. We will excuse the craziness that goes on in this world. But somebody dare say that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and that he gave us eternal life in his salvation and dropped the Holy Ghost down on the earth and we're the ones who are crazy. We're the ones who are lunatics. We're the ones who aren't smart enough. We're the ones that don't have it all together. Let me tell you something. Jesus Christ is coming very soon and it won't be long and you won't have to deal with us much longer. Mm. That's right. That's right. It was Peter who jumped up in the middle of the crowd at the day of Pentecost and said, these are not drunken as you suppose, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel saying in the Old Testament he said, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. The power of the spirit of God and the word of God is alive in this house right now. I want you right, I feel this so strong. I want as many of you as Quill, I want you to kind of bring this down just a little bit for me. I want you to bow your heads all over this place. Pastor Gary mentioned a few moments ago that he felt that there was someone here who had been contemplating suicide. You know, the parties of the world, they, they won't solve problems of suicide. Your friends in the world, they won't solve the problems that you have in this life. They'll never solve them. All they do is help you to hide from them and escape. Suicide is taking people by storm these days 
And I believed and I felt the Spirit of the Lord when Gary mentioned that there was someone here this morning that had contemplated suicide. What the Lord has done in this house is not only refreshed and edified the body, which this is a shock, you know, this wasn't on the plan. We, we didn't organize this. I, I'm supposed to do, we were supposed to do communion, then prayer and offering. I'm supposed to take an offering right now. But we have stopped the order of service because the Spirit of the Lord took over in this place. And the reason why I say if you don't feel what's going on right now, if you don't, down in your heart, if, if there isn't a trembling inside your spirit that I would worry about your future, is because it is so powerful and so strong in this place right now. There is a move in this house that God is trying desperately to rescue someone I don't know if it's the same person. All I know is this. The Holy Spirit has interrupted this service right now for you. He wants you to understand that He loves you. That He's proving Himself to be real to you. He's making His presence known in this house. And just like the song just says, He won't relent until He has you. He will chase you until your last breath because he loves you. He wants you to spend eternity with him. This life is fleeting and over before you know it. The graveyards are filled with people who thought they would never, never die. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, someone came in here today and either... You are the one who, who has been dealing and thinking about suicide in your life. You feel like you have nothing to live for. Your life has crumbled all around you. And you probably only came here this morning because you, you were looking to, to see if there might be something for you. A word telling you his presence is here in a mighty way. And I don't have to conjure up the presence of the Holy Spirit that is now speaking to your heart. You know exactly who you are. And He has already prepared your heart. I'm going to follow the instructions I feel in my spirit. And give you right now the opportunity to accept Jesus into your life right where you're standing. You say, aren't you supposed to do that at the end of service? Aren't you supposed to do that at the conclusion? That's man's way. But the Holy Spirit has decided right now is the hour. You're ready to receive him right now where you stand. If you're here today, you need Jesus in your heart. We're going to pray a prayer that's going to bring you into relationship with Jesus right now. You're going to make an altar where you're standing right now. And if you are going to pray that prayer, I want your hand to shoot up right where you are and then right back down. Here's a couple of hands. Any others? Any others? Right now, you need Jesus you're going to pray this prayer this morning. Is there anyone else? God bless you, brother. Anyone else? Anyone else? Young lady, God bless you, sir. Anyone else? God's intervened right here for you. Several hands have went up. Is there anyone else? A few moments. Need to get things right with God. If he came back for me today, I would not be ready. I would not go to heaven, and nothing is worth it. This misery in my spirit. Are you here? God bless you. God bless you. Any others? A few more seconds. A few more seconds. All right. Church, I want you to help me. We're going to pray this prayer together. If you didn't lift your hand, but you still need... To get things right with Jesus, you're more than welcome to pray this prayer. It's between you and the Lord. Let's pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. I believe you're the Son of God. I know you died for me. I know this is real. Lord, be my Lord. Change my heart. Be the Lord of my life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Somebody shout with me this morning. Praise God. Praise God.
He won't relent. He won't relent. He won't stop until he has you. The most important thing God wants to do is save your heart, your soul. The most important reason why we've come together today is for that salvation in your life. I'm going to let you go ahead and be seated. Thank you, choir. In case you hadn't noticed, we are a Pentecostal church. And I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. Pentecost is more real to me than, the, than the, anything else I got going in my entire life. Way more, looking at a man that should be dead with his arm around a woman that should be dead. But God performed a miracle. A miracle. Oh, yeah, right. We'll prove it. <laughs> We've got plenty of doctors who want you want to take the time. Go ahead. You go talk to them. You, they'll let you... They'll take you to the file. They'll take you to the doctor. They'll sit you down. The doctor will shake their head and go, no, we don't know why they're alive. They're alive this morning because God touched them and they're healed. I'm looking at stage four cancer right here. Should be dead. Every time she goes back to get the report, they told her she had two weeks to live. How many years ago? Three and a half, almost four years ago. They told her she had two weeks. Here she is this morning. Healed by the power of God. Healed. Man, given the last rites, told he had cancer. Just watched him go down to hardly nothing. Didn't think he, there was going to be a future for Mike K. Now, that's been how many years ago? Huh? 2001. How many years is that? I can't add this morning. That's 12 years ago. 12. 12 years he's been free from cancer. In God good. Where are the miracles? Right here, silly. Get your, get your head out of the world and get your ears out of listening to Oprah and tune it in to the church for a minute. Miracles are everywhere. Danny, how many, he went to hospice. They gave Danny up. Danny, stand up right there where you are. Danny is a walking total 100% miracle. Over a year ago, wasn't it? Over, over a year ago, they told her, they said, nothing. Do, do, make him comfortable. We're going to send him to hospice. He's done. He's over. Well, I'm glad you didn't believe him. I'm glad you didn't believe him. Amen. Praise God. Who knows what's going to happen next? <laughs> the presence of the Lord is here in a great way. We are refined, classy folks, I promise you. But we believe in God who's alive. The power of God that's real. If I trusted in the things, the promises, the philosophies, even the education and the success of this world, I would be, as the Bible says, of most men miserable. There's nothing good in the news. There's nothing good about the economy. There's nothing good about any country. There's no safe place. We're not even promised that the world's going to make it past the next asteroid. There is no hope here. But there is an anchor for my soul. There is a hope for my heart this morning. And it's a God who bankrupt his own throne to come to this earth, give his life as a ransom for my salvation. And I am celebrating that this morning. Amen. Amen. Our ushers are coming to serve you. This is our opportunity to give in worship. Many of you have come prepared and ready to give. And someone says, so you're going to go right to the offering? You better believe I am because I am a giver and I want the opportunity. Now, those who don't want the opportunity, please do me a favor. Do the church a favor. Do God a favor. Keep your money. Have you ever heard that from a preacher? Keep your money. I don't want it. The only money that I want God to bless and God to, to, 
to be in these plates this morning as we pray over this is those that are giving to God. Those that are giving from a heart where they want to worship Him. A grudge dollar isn't blessed. So it'll sit in the plate and I don't know what good it'll do us. So you see, everybody's happy. You keep yours. But if you want to worship the Lord, if you want to be blessed of the Lord, how many have been blessed because you give to God? I have. I can testify to you. I've had it when I didn't have it because I've given when it was ever an opportunity. So as we give this morning, you pay your tithes, you pay loose offering. All the loose offering this morning goes to world missions that don't even stay in our church. And then, of course, if you are though, some of those wonderful, faithful, God-blessed people that are helping us with the building program, thank you for your gifts. Thank you that you're continuing to help us and to continuing to pay your pledge and your promise or give a gift or donation. We are almost there. I've got news for you in just a few weeks, and I'm, just, I, I'm keeping my lips sealed. But I've got some news for you. Don't give up yet. We're almost there. Going to have some good news for you in just a few weeks. Help us. Continue to help us. If you don't know what we're talking about, we're in a building program, and we are almost ready to kick dirt. And so we need you to jump on board and be with us. Make your pledge of $2 million, and everybody will just love you. A million five will be fine. No worries. You're new. <laughs> Father, we ask you to bless our gifts. Bless the givers. Touch those missionaries on the field that we want to bless. Lord, we learned a long time ago that if we as a church will practice giving before we teach giving, that, Lord, you'll bless it all. So we thank you for our missionaries on the field. Touch them this morning and meet needs in their lives through us. And thank you for those who are faithful to pay their tithe. Still praying, Father, for 100% tithers, givers in our church that know the blessing of God's grace on their lives. And I pray that you will meet the needs that we have as a congregation and a church as we move forward in this building project and in what we're doing for this community. In Christ's name, amen.
don't you put your hands together one more time. Let's give him praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. You don't know this young man. His name's Louis. Luis. He's got a touch of God. He, the God brought him back from the streets, you see. God brought him, brought him back from the gangs, you see. He used to hurt people. Now he helps people. He used to be against God. Now he's for God. Praise God. Praise God. Carlos sitting right next to him. Carlos has got a powerful testimony. Those, those boys have been taken from the toughest, roughest places on earth. They were in gangs. They hurt people. But God has changed their lives and now they live to praise God. And that's really what this is all about. I'm amazed at how the Lord brings it all together. Starting a series this morning on recovery, and we don't care how long it takes. I said it'd take eight weeks, but it'll probably take nine, ten weeks. Who knows? The important thing is that I believe this is instrumental for our church because it's never before. See, we're going to move beyond the shout. How many know I like the shout? I mean, we already had that this morning, didn't we? Bob, I like the shout. I think somebody's been touched by the master of the creator of the universe and the Holy Spirit is down inside of him. I agree with the Bible writer that said it's like fire shut up in my bones. I can't shut it up. Now, you don't understand. See, the world thinks we're nuts, but that's okay because they don't understand. They don't have the power of the universe turning over and over inside their spirit. They don't have that. So I'm okay that they think we're nuts. I'm okay. I look at them and, and you know, people have said that before. And I say, well, you, you, I understand. I, I can't imagine that you would think it's anything else but just absolute insanity. But when you come to know what I know. And you've been touched, Kyle, with what I've been touched with. And he takes you. When your soul was black as the ace of spades and makes it whiter than the driven snow, you, you just don't know how that feels until you've been set free. Free. Oh man, you don't understand. Freedom is free to be able to do whatever I want. Don't tell me what to do. Let me be my own God. Yeah, I heard that. I, I, I've heard that actually for years. I've been to many prisons and stood on the other side of a glass from people that have said those things. Yeah, I understand. It's real freedom. You see, the next several weeks, this is not an easy message to preach to church, Trent, because this is the real deal. Jesus ate with sinners. Jesus said when the religious folks wasn't going to cut it, he said go out in the highways and the byways and compel all the street folks to come in. I believe Stratford Heights is finally at this place in our history where we are really focused on the heart of Christ. We want more than ever before. Like I said, I love the shout. Stephanie, I love the shout. I love the Holy Spirit. I would never deny Him, ever. He has first place in this church. If you didn't understand why the whole church went crazy a few minutes ago when I brought this chair out here, it's because last Sunday morning we preached a message about the chair, didn't we? About Christ, putting Christ in that chair. Him present at every service, at every event, at everything we do in our lives. There is so much entrapment, deception, lies in this world 
It is killing our sons and daughters. It is destroying our families. The seeds of this deception that have been laid down inside of our hearts and our souls, our minds for years, un hidden under the abuse and the self-identity crises and all of the labels that have come through society. All of this has caused us to be sitting on a keg of dynamite in many ways. Homes destroyed overnight. Families destroyed the standards in, of righteousness and holy living, all of those things in question as the whole world looks to the church. And for so long, the church was guilty of shouting just fine. But not knowing what to do when the shouting is done. Over the next several weeks, we're going to talk about what do you do when the shouting's done. What do you do when the lightning bolt was a start? And how many times have I seen this? The church has been really guilty for a long time. When the, when the power's fallen and people are getting blessed and touched, we'll, then we'll take the drug addict, then we'll take the alcoholic, then we'll take those that have been in abusive situations, then we'll take the adulterer, then we'll take the problems of the world and all the people that are just involved in a whole list of stuff. Then we'll take them and we'll slap our hand on their forehead and say, now go, don't ever do it again. We've done that for generations of generations of generations. We don't understand the premise. You see, I believe in the power as we sung of the blood. I believe that Jesus can transform you. I know he can turn you upside down. Turn your joy, your sorrow into joy. He can make everything all right. God has the ability to transform you in a second. I believe that with all of my heart. But I also know that with that powerful touch on your life and with that commitment to Christ, with salvation given to you as a free gift. Mercy, unmerited favor of God given to you free of charge. With that comes a responsibility to step into what Jesus said to the, to the disciples. He told them in Matthew 28, he said, go make. I'm going to let that sink in for a minute. Go make disciples he didn't say go pray for disciples go shout for disciples go pour on a big music program and a big preacher for for disciples no he said go make them make them in the making my mind went to Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 if you would turn there and, and I'm sorry chapter 12 verse 1 Over the next several weeks, we're going to focus on the word recovery. Recovery. Because what I want to see in the church is that when people come forward or when they accept Christ and when the, the shouting is done, we then begin the process of discipleship in their lives so that when they walk out, they can live victorious. I would like to see more overcomers not just, I, I'm, I'm a little tired and I've actually stopped the counting. I don't count new converts on my reports anymore. They're probably going to think when it's all said and done, I didn't do one good thing. Because I don't count them anymore. I want to count overcomers. People that accept Christ and begin the journey of walking in victory. I want to see victory. That's what this next several weeks is going to be about. And I only have a few moments to cover this introduction this morning. And then I'll jump into it full scale. I only have 22 pages of notes here for one sermon. Can you stay till three? All right. <laughs> All right. Romans 12 and 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren. I beg you, brethren. He's saying, I beg you in... In light of, and he just spent 11 chapters writing about salvation and the blood of Christ and the, the wonderful salvation experience, the gift of God that comes through 
through the surrender and the Roman road and all that he did. Eleven chapters, he built the theology of salvation. So then in verse, at chapter 12 and verse 1, he says, Okay, in light of all those eleven chapters, I beseech you, I beg you, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice. Holy. Say holy. Acceptable to God. Say acceptable. Which is your logical or reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given to me. To everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. We're responsible for one another. Say amen. Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 18. I have seen how they acted, says God. But I will heal them. I will lead them. I will help them. And I will comfort those who mourn. I offer peace to all near and far. Father, I pray over the next several weeks that you will bless your word. And as we look into this study and as we begin to understand true discipleship the Lord has set us really free really really free in the name of Jesus Christ we pray amen he said in that chapter 12 verse 1 present your body give your body give your body to God once you've given your heart to God then he wants you to present your body to him you have to sacrifice give yourself Once you presented your body, he says, a living sacrifice, willing to sacrifice. That means don't, it all ain't about you. And I'm telling you, we live in it. I said it last week, I'll say it again. We live in a very selfish culture, society. Self, me, me, me. Leave me alone. Let me do what I want to do. It's all about me. And that is very sad. It's very sad when you see young people, when you see young married folks, when you see people in general, when they all they want to do is talk about, think about, plan for, and do nothing for anybody else but themselves. Me. It's a very me-generated society, and it's sad. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy. Somebody say amen. Amen have to be holy like it or not like it want to hear it or don't want to hear it the bible says be holy for i am holy be holy figure out what that is and be it read god's word and follow it if any man will come after me let him deny himself take up his cross and follow me acceptable to god We have to be acceptable to God, not acceptable to the church, not acceptable to the church of God, not acceptable to the preacher, not acceptable to the wife or the husband, acceptable to God. And do not be molded into this world's ways. Don't fall for the traps of this world. They will tell you God's not real. They will tell you you can pray to a tree. They will tell you that whales are God. They'll even tell you, as I said last week, Michael Jackson has now been resurrected as God. People pray to him. The world will tell you all kinds of deception and all kinds of lies. Don't be molded into their world, into their ways. But be, he said, transformed. Who who was he talking to? He was talking to believers. He was talking to believers. He's telling believers. See, that takes us away from the mentality that we just get the big lightning bolt at the altar and we're all good. No wonder people come and get saved and they get repentant and they turn their life over. Perhaps you have given your life to Christ in the past and you said, well, it didn't help me none. I went right back into the same life and I had the same problems. I never got better. I still do the same things I've always done. Of course you will. You always will. In you, in your power, in your flesh. How many of you know the flesh does not get saved? 
I am constantly amazed at the people who think the flesh gets saved. And I see some of them. They walk in church sometimes. I ain't going to tell you who you are, but you walk in church sometimes and it's just like, you think you're walking on water. You have my seat. Did you see did you see that man walk in? Someone get me my smelling salts. We think we get an attitude sometimes. We think, boy, when we got saved, boy, he did it. Perfection. We sit back and mm -hmm. we watch everybody. We watch the preacher. We watch everything coming and going. I've told you before how people love to catch me at the grocery market. Well, Brother Phillips, how you doing? <laughs> what you buying today, preacher? It's amazing. We've got this mentality sometimes that, that we don't need discipled and we don't need transformed. He said, present your bodies, believers, a living sacrifice, and be holy, be acceptable. Live out the perfect will of God in your life. And do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's what recovery is all about. And over the next several weeks, we're going to discuss and look at, take apart. I'll finally get down through the, through the notes I have and we'll discuss recovery, true recovery. I'm interested in how we can truly take folks who are in impossible situations, people that have been abused, people that have gone through suicide attempts, people that have had all kinds of traps in their lives and they've had all kinds of labels on them. They've found themselves in one trashed situation after another or perhaps they found themselves completely enamored by the drug addictions or alcoholism or the chains that come through all kinds of obsessive mentalities i'm telling you there's all these things the church used to be afraid of we're no longer afraid anymore because we have found out that jesus christ is able to set everyone free everybody we're not afraid of them anymore we're not afraid to just pray and say, okay, mm, don't do it no more. And then if they go, and if, if, oh my goodness, if they go and they, they, they do more drugs or they, they get another drink in two weeks, we, well, they didn't really get saved. Yes, they did. They were broken and repentant. They were, they were sorry before God. They heard a song or a message. They were invited to an altar. They felt when they went to that altar, they were giving their lives to Christ. But because we put this expectation of perfection on top of everybody so much, they usually walk out defeated and they think they didn't get saved neither. The truth of it is, you see, they get saved. Jesus saves the soul, but the flesh has got to be transformed. The flesh has got to be conformed to God's ways. And then, once that renewing has taken place in our minds, we walk among those that have been sanctified and made holy before God. And our steps get lighter and lighter every day. Yes, it gets better. Listen to me. Yes, it gets better. Yes, you get past the craving. Yes, you get past all of the, the, the temptations. Yes, you do. It's a day-by-day -day struggle. It's every day staying in the Word. Every day living in victory. Every day letting Jesus literally transform your mind and change your thinking. When He changes your thinking, that's when you begin to truly be free. Free to not be enslaved. That's freedom. And it changes us and sets us free. I thank our church so much. We're going to be making parallel um, illustrations and talking about Celebrate Recovery because Celebrate Recovery is a, over 100 strong on Friday nights at our church. 
It's, it's reaching out. It's the church finally opening that door and going into the room where all of these people were that we didn't know what to do with anymore back in the day. And now we're saying to them, there's a way, there's a program, there's steps, there's things we can do. Let us talk to you about the fact that first of all, first and foremost, you are powerless to help yourself. You can't do it. That was the greatest news that ever came to me as a young man. When somebody finally got the word into me because I was struggling, Christian, so hard. I laid my face in the altars, or I laid my face in my bedroom at my mom and dad's house, and I cried, and I cried, and I said, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. I spent more time crying forgiveness and asking God to forgive me for all the sins I just felt like I was constantly crushed under. Finally, one day the Lord got through to me and he let me know, Jen, you're never going to get con- you're never going to conquer sin. You're never going to be stronger than sin. That's why you got to stay real close to me and let me help you get up. I told you last week, the only difference, I told you earlier, the only difference between us and anybody who's ever struggled or failed trying to be a Christian is only one thing. Every time we hit the floor, we get right back up and we keep walking and we keep finding the victory in our steps one after the other until we get to the place where victory is ours. It's so important that we understand the process of making disciples, transforming our minds. Some of you you, you've been Christians for many years. And you have yet, you have yet to have been discipled. We want so much to understand the steps that lead us into victory so that when others find their way into our congregation, my heart's cry, and you've heard me say this before, my heart's cry, and I know what time it is, is that people from the community and people from the city, people from the streets, boys, people from the bad places on earth will find their way into this church and next to you on a pew, and they'll be received and welcomed and hugged and handshaked and they'll be even led if they are open to Christ into this altar to be saved and then transformed and changed so that on a Sunday morning when the Spirit of God is moving and the power of God is falling, the same young man that used to hurt people on the street, that used to be part of a gang, is standing up in the middle of a congregation crying out, Jesus! That's what I want. I want us to have the kind of truth that transforms the entire world. I want us to be the church that Jesus meant us to be. And over these next several weeks, we're going to talk. And first, we're going to go through R-E-C-O-V-E-R-Y. I told you I was educated. We're going to cover eight principles. I don't know how long it'll take. We're going to cover eight principles over the next several weeks. The only week I will not be covering one of those subjects is the week that I am in Columbia, South America, preaching. And that Sunday morning, you're going to be praying for me. Say amen. amen. Over 700, they say, are registered for that conference now. And I'm just getting more nervous as the days come, as it gets closer. But God is going to help us as we truly begin to uncover the principles of recovery and how you will then be able to to speak life into your own family, into your own friends, and perhaps, here's the big mystery, perhaps even into your own life, perhaps you have hidden, you've hidden a past, you've hidden stuff in your life, you've hidden abuse, you've hidden habits, you've hidden hurts that no one knows about. We are going to talk and share about how you're going to be able to learn to walk over top of those things and not let them define you anymore. I'm talking about going into the closets of our most feared pasts and literally letting the light of God shine in there to bring healing to your heart. That's what we want.
Will you stick with me over the next several weeks? Amen. Stand with me this morning. This is an introduction, and I got all the way to page three. Next Sunday, I will continue. We're going to talk about the letter R, the letter R next Sunday. You will not want to miss that. I will be preaching tonight. I I will not be doing this series. I'm going to be saving this to do particularly on Sunday mornings. But I want you to be in prayer for us because this stuff is going to be controversial to some of you. It is not going to sit comfortably with some of you because we're going to be a church that genuinely loves our community. And we're going to do more than talk about it. Say amen. It's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to really take steps to do it. We have action. I like a meeting that I had with the lady who's back here this morning. We've got some great plans for some fantastic community events. Community outreach is going to be happening from our church. Our focus is going to turn from our four walls to this city, and we're going to love this city to death. If you like that, say amen. We're going to focus on meeting the needs of people and bringing to them the reality of Jesus. And if you're one of those people that don't like that, If you're one of those people that's not comfortable with drugs and alcoholics and people that come in that have got all kinds of chains hanging off of them, if you're not comfortable with that, then I'll help you. I'll either help you understand and we'll comfort you and and I'll take you out to old Charlie's and we'll talk about it or I'll understand if you tell me that this is just not your church. I don't want to say that. But I'm not going to fight with anyone in order to reach hurting people. I'm not going to fuss with people in order to reach hurting people. I want to see more of this right there. I want to see more of him right there. And you know what I want? What I love more than anything else, this proves that I'm church of God to the bone. What I love more than anything else is when I come here on Friday night and I see Audrey and she's back in the back and we're talking about drug addiction and people that have been sober for a month and they, the chains of depression and suicide have dropped from them and they're being set free from alcohol and I see Audrey with her hands up in the air crying, big old tears dripping down her face. There's nothing I love more than seeing Church of God folks who really get it. There ain't nothing more beautiful than that. It's awesome. So I'm looking forward to us over the next several weeks getting down to it. Bring a pen because there's going to be lots of notes. And we're going to take notes and we're going to change. Change the church in the mentality of sinners. We're going to love them to death. Amen. Father, I praise you and I thank you. We've turn this whole service around it's almost like we're greeting folks now I pray that you'll go with us as a congregation this afternoon be with our families touch us together and God I pray over this next week that you'll touch our people that they will have a genuine burden for the lost for the hurting for those people Lord that are rejected by society and have found no help they've tried programs they've tried to quit they've tried to stop and they can't Lord, I pray and I ask you, please, lay this burden on our church's heart to be the church that they can run to. Lord, we want to be like the first responders I saw yesterday. We we don't want to be ones running from the fire. We want to be ones, Lord, that you will anoint to run to the fire so that we might be used to rescue the hurting and the lost. I pray this prayer over our congregation as we go today. May they be blessed. May they find great rest this afternoon. And Lord, I pray that many of them will find their way back here tonight, 6 o'clock, for church again, together with wonderful, wonderful music and great preaching, but most of all, the presence of Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you.